So the first part that I'd like to share with you is what's called the whole person concept. And this is a really good insight into how we as people operate. So for example, you can see behavior here at the top. So I'm going to give the analogy that a human being is a bit like an iceberg. So I'm just going to draw a very dodgy looking iceberg. You like my iceberg? So that's the iceberg. And then here we've got the ocean level. So I've done this in red. Maybe it's the Red Sea, for example. <laughs> Come on, courtesy laugh, courtesy laugh, thanks. So we see, just like the iceberg, where you see what's above the surface, with people, we also see what's above the surface, which tends to be their behaviour. So I'm sure you've noticed when people are sad or happy or angry or frustrated, that's all behaviour. But my question to you is, what's the number one thing that would affect your behaviour or somebody else's behaviour? Have a think about it. What we found it to be is... Wait for it. It's what you think about, so you're thinking, and your feelings. Hopefully you can make my writing out. We're thinking and feeling all the time. So if you get cut off in traffic, for example, you might be thinking not so nice thoughts about who just cut you off, and that can often affect your behaviour. And the interesting thing too with thinking and feeling is often they counteract each other. So for instance, if you were to wake up during the week and let's say you're at work, you might be feeling like you'd love to stay in bed because it feels warm and cosy. However, your thinking is what gets you out of bed because you know you have to be at work. And maybe a bit later in the day, your feelings actually catch up because you might actually feel like being there once you've got into things and you're on a bit of a roll. Whereas another example could be if it was the weekend and maybe it's a day off for you, you might be feeling like you want to stay in bed again because it's the weekend and it's warm and cosy again. Your thinking is going, well, you know, I should get into the day, it's really my only day off or only one of two days off. But your feelings take over and take charge and you stay in bed for that extra sleep in. So we're thinking and feeling all the time, but that's what the number one thing is that affects our behaviour. So now what affects our thinking and feeling? Well again, quite interestingly, it's two things. The first one is your values, and the second is your beliefs. Often these two are quite intertwined. Now, a value is what governs your life. It's what's really, really important to you. Whereas a belief tends to be what you think is right or wrong. Now, I personally believe that your beliefs are the number one factor that determines how your life turns out and whether you succeed or not. It's a big statement and it's a different topic or a different time to talk about that in more depth. But your beliefs are what you think is right or wrong and your, what you value is what's most important to you in life. That's what affects your thinking and feeling. That's what affects your behavior. Now you might have, let's say you're in a family situation or a work situation, you might have some beliefs and values that not everybody in the family or the workplace hold the same beliefs. So you might have a, a, a belief at work, for instance, that punctuality is very, very important if you happen to be the boss or the boss has this belief, but there may be an employee or two that don't have that belief. They don't think punctuality is important. They turn up late and it causes all sorts of havoc. Or in the home, it might be that if you're a, a parent, you might like the whole family to eat at the same time and maybe not to leave. I remember when I was a child, it, it was impolite to leave the table before you'd finished. So you might have those values or those beliefs and if someone goes against that, we need to go a little bit deeper into the iceberg. We're going deep, deep, deep now because what we want to look at is individual needs. 
Now, an individual need, a classic example of a need could be the need for food. Everyone of us gets hungry, right? You might be hungry right now. Now, if you just had a meal, you don't have that need. But let's say you haven't eaten for a while. What happens is you've got the need, your values and beliefs might kick in because if you tend to be fairly health conscious like myself, you may not want to have McDonald's. You might look for a healthy or alternative at least, whether it's a salad or some vegetables on the side or something. The more you think about food, the, the more you feel hungry, and the more you feel hungry and the more you think about it, that affects your behavior. Now we're here to talk about DISC, and what DISC does very, very well is manage needs, but from a psychology or a psychological point of view. So for example, it will measure things like some people have a need for achievement or challenge. Other people have a need for significance. Others have a need for, for status quo, keeping the status quo. You know, don't like change. Others have a need for accuracy. So there's all these different psychological needs. A DISC measures it from a behavioral perspective. Because the beautiful thing is, we notice behavior already, so now, you may be able to see somebody's behavior in a different light. And once we go through the next section, you may know what needs they're displaying. So you can cater to those needs very, very quickly. So not only is the other person satisfied, so highly likely they'll be more motivated to, whether it's to do what you want to do or motivated to do what they want to do, but you'll also be a more effective communicator, you'll be a better influencer, and everybody wins. Because when you're treating people how they want to be treated, how can you go wrong? And remember, this is in all types of relationships. It doesn't matter what type of relationship it is, this can benefit you. And the next part where we get into the real nitty gritty of DISC is the part that you will be able to apply immediately. It's very, very interesting. It's quite simple also. So I think you're going to love it. So let's get on to that one. See you in a sec. So let's get into this little thing known as DISC. I've mentioned before that Professor William Marsden created the theory around DISC back in the early 1920s. And there's really two parts to my presentation today. The first part is to do with this theory, which gives you a really good concrete understanding and really the backbone to why this science is so powerful. And the second part is the language itself. So you can apply it immediately to increase the level of your communication with other people, to enhance those relationships, to understand others more effectively, and also to learn about yourself and to learn your own strengths and weaknesses. You see, I believe all we have is language. If you look at my mission statement, my company's mission statement behind me, you can see this, it says transform the way you communicate with the world. So having yourself as only having language, you have verbal language, you have body language, you have that internal chatter, and that little voice in your head that talks constantly. If you said, what little voice? That's the voice. You have written language, whether that's emailing or perhaps it's text messaging. It's all different types of language. And in society, the more effective your language is and the higher your communication skills are with other people, and also yourself, you actually get rewarded. You get rewarded with extra finances, you earn extra income, your relationships are of a higher quality, so therefore you get better results in all areas of your life. So I'm very excited to share not only my mission statement with you, but also the theory and the practicality of DISC, because I believe it's a huge and very beneficial tool that will help you transform the way you communicate with the world. So without further ado, behind me on the whiteboard here, set up a little bit of a diagram. So we've got DISC at the top here. And Professor William Marsden had one main observation about behavior. And that was that it all relied on your perception. And there was two types, or two parts really, to this perception. And the first part is along this axis. And it's the perception, perception of the environment.
how you perceive an environment if you walk into an office or you walk into, let's say it's a hostile environment, for example, you're going to behave differently than if it's an environment that you're very comfortable in. So two ends of the scale. One is what we call favorable. And my apologies to my American and Canadian friends again for the spelling, it's the English or the Australian spelling. And then on the other side, we've got unfavorable. So again, you think about when you walk in, let's say your home is very favorable. Often when you walk into home, hopefully you feel relaxed, you're more open. If you're in a favorable environment, generally you're comfortable. You may even, if you're in a favorable environment, you may even be more accepting of faults. So you might go to a course or you might be watching this video and if you feel comfortable and it's a favorable environment for you, if there was a mistake or two, you might be more forgiving than if it was initially an unfavorable environment. So you feel safe here, you feel often relaxed. You may not show that you're relaxed on the outside, because for some people, relaxing is running around a million miles an hour, but on the inside, you feel at ease. Whereas compared to an unfavorable environment, often you're more guarded, more tense. Some people show it outwardly, whether that's in frustration or anger or being argumentative, but generally we're more judging. So there's a term that we use for unfavorable, and that is assessing. assessing, whereas a favorable environment is more accepting. If you meet somebody for the first time and they're very open to you and they're warm, often they're allowing you to notice that for them it's a favorable environment. Whereas if somebody is a little bit more difficult to get to know, they seem reserved, they don't seem that likable initially, Potentially for them, it may be an unfavorable environment. So they're simply assessing, seeing if they maybe can trust you or to get comfortable with the surroundings. No right or wrong, just favorable and unfavorable. The other part to William Marsden's theory around perception was the perception of your personal power And that's over the environment. So it's the perception of your personal power over the environment. So if you're in a, an environment, again, let's say, I used the example before of that you're at home. If you feel that you have the power to change that environment, you'd be up this end of the scale, which sees yourself as more powerful than the environment. Now it could be exactly the same person. You might be in a work situation, maybe it's a meeting that you're going into, maybe it's a negotiation, or maybe you've got colleagues or bosses in that meeting also. You may see yourself as less powerful than that environment. You may not be able to feel like you can change it. So on that side of this coin, you'd be at the bottom here, which sees yourself as less powerful than the environment. Now the example I just gave is using exactly the same person but in two different environments. One you may feel more powerful, the other you may feel less powerful. Because as we get into what the actual disc language is and the four styles which fits into each one of these quadrants if you will, You'll notice that you actually have a bit of all of them. But in all my years of doing this and the study right back to the 1920s, most people, if not all, have what's called a predominant behavioral style, and often a secondary one as well. But generally, the other two are far less in strength. So you would display certain behavioral styles a lot more often 
than others. That's the majority of the people anyway. So you might see yourself more often than not, you feel that you're more powerful than most environments than you're in, that you're in. So, and when that's the case, often there's things like you may be more change focused. And you're accepting of change. You actually want change. You might want challenge. Because if, you're, if you see yourself more powerful than environment, you want that change. You want challenge. You might be a little bit more active in your actions. You may be more direct with your communication because you're attempting to change that environment. Let's use the, the uh, example of the office again. If it's the meeting is going on, you want to change that environment, you feel that you're more powerful than the environment, so you can, often your language is more direct. I hope that makes sense so far. Whereas at the other end of the scale here, you see yourself as less powerful than that environment, so you're not prone to change at all. So you don't actually like change. And also less active and less direct, so it's more sort of indirect, more passive, and likes this, what we call the status quo. And status quo is just simply keeping things as they are. Don't like change, especially sudden change. Whereas at, at this end, these behavioural styles, remember we're talking about behaviour here, not people. There's a big distinction between the two. If my little daughter Madison, for example, if she does something, like she a few weeks ago she scribbled all over my lounge in marker pen. Now, if I made that about her, I'm blaming her, getting angry with her, that's much bigger than if I'm not accepting the behavior that she's just displayed. So hopefully you can see where I'm coming from there. So it's somebody's behavior, not the person themselves. What else have we got here? So more powerful than the environment, change focused, like challenge, more active, more direct, compared to less powerful than the environment, more indirect, more passive, likes more the status quo. So as we get into the four styles now, I'll give you a good overview of what they are. So if you feel that you're in an unfavorable environment and you're assessing that environment, but you see yourself as more powerful, just going over this again, it's likely that you'll want to change it because it's unfavorable. Whereas over here, it's a favorable, accepting environment. So maybe, you, why would you want to change it? And especially if you see yourself as less powerful using that meeting as the example, you wouldn't want to change it because it's highly likely favorable anyway. So over here, because it's more powerful, challenge, active, direct, change orientated, we call this a high D. And if you want to know the actual term, high D stands for dominant. And a dominant behavioral style tends to tell rather than ask. Often they want to get to the bottom line very quickly. They love change, they love challenge, they want to be challenged. Whereas over here, well, I'll go through them in more detail in a second, this is what's known as high I. And high I stands for influencer. I'll put influence here if you can read that. The writing's a bit scruffy and a bit small, sorry about that. This stands for influence. So high I sees themselves as more powerful than the environment. So using that meeting as the example again, they feel that they can change it, but it's a favorable environment. So they feel they can change it, but they don't have to be direct. They, can, they feel they can change that environment if they choose to through their language, through their influence skills. And people will believe them because they're very believable, they're very influential, and they're people people. In fact, that's a great distinction because on this side of the scale here, it's more to do with task orientated. And over here, wherever there's room, it's more people orientated. So being task orientated, haven't gone through the bottom two here yet. However, often they could sit behind a desk and do their work very effectively, very efficiently without seeing anyone else. Whereas these guys would actually go crazy 
by not being interacting with people, being interactive with people, sorry. Over here, so we've got high influence. Over here is high S, which stands for steadiness. And squeezer in there. Steadiness, high S types of people, again, less powerful than the environment, don't feel that they can change it, like the status quo, so they don't like change, often won't speak up when something's bothering them. So what happens is I've got some clients that have been like this, they tend to hold things in. Very, very nice people generally, or behavioral styles at least, have, tend to hold things in rather than speak up. Hate conflict, really don't like conflict at all. So we'll keep things in, don't want to upset anybody, want to be liked, very team orientated, very team orientated. So if ever I'm speaking to somebody that's high S in behavior, especially if it's that predominant behavioral style, and let's say that their boss who I'm working with directly wants to implement some change. When I'm speaking to high S behavior, I talk about step by step. I slow my voice down a little bit. I'll say things like, at your own time, at your own pace. I'll ask a question and I'll be very, very patient to get an answer. I may ask the same question a few different ways and come from a different angle until they feel comfortable. Because high S behavior want to feel comfortable. It's one of their number one goals. And then finally, we've got high C behavior, which stands for conscientiousness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the spelling's okay. And high C behaviour, again, unfavourable environment, and see themselves generally as less powerful than that environment. So what high C behaviour often looking for is in within existing circumstances. So whether that's at home, at work, or outside in the big wide world, often looking for what needs fixing what's not what right, what could uh, systems maybe, or processes, what could be improved upon within an existing environment. If you took a high C behavioral style and put them in a favorable environment, often they become very suspicious. There must be something wrong here, and I'm gonna find out what it is. Very prone to doing a lot of research. If you happen to be selling or marketing to somebody that's high C in behavioral style, make sure you give them all the information, all the details, literally all. Any mistakes in your presentation or even spelling mistakes in emails and things can be a major thing to somebody who's high C in behavior. Tends to often can have a perfectionist aspect to their behavioral style, which in some instances is quite a good thing, so for example, high C behavior, very good thinkers, very good with the mind. So roles that they may have, things like engineers or accounting, finance, that kind of career. Not all obviously, but I'm just giving you some examples. And if let's say they're working on the new A380 Airbus airplane, and they're an engineer on that plane, you wanna make sure that they're checking every little thing. You want them to be a perfectionist. You want them to dot their I's, cross their T's, make sure everything's done. Whereas if you happen to be high C behavior, how many times have you or people that you know spent a lot of time on something that didn't necessarily need a lot of time spending on it? Perhaps it didn't matter if this particular thing wasn't done perfectly, but you, have, you may have spent hours and hours on something that should have only taken 20 minutes. So that's actually not being effective. So all of the behavioral styles have pros and cons to them. And what I'm suggesting is for high C, for example, to take a look and at a favorable environment and attempt to be okay with that. Attempt to be okay with the people side of things, just to practice that. Because you'll notice there's some opposites here. Dominant and steadiness from very direct to very indirect very task orientated, very people orientated, very change orientated, let's keep the status quo. High influence, very people orientated, again, very often very talkative, love to talk about their favorite topic, which tends to be themselves. Whereas high C behavior, 
is very, very different to that. It's more task orientated. Again, can sit behind a computer often all day, every day, close the office door and not be disturbed by anybody. It would actually prefer that, whereas this would drive high eye behavior insane. <laughs> now we talked earlier about needs that we have from the whole person concept. We looked at behavior, then we looked at your thinking and feeling which affects your behavior. We touched on your values and your beliefs, which I'd love to go into more depth with at another point. And then finally, we looked at the needs. And what DISC measures is your behavior, but from a needs perspective on a psychological point of view. A need for a high D, high dominant, is the need for results. It's a need for challenge. If you took a high dominant that's generally in an unfavorable environment, and you put them into a favorable environment. Let's say you went out for a dinner party, and there's a whole group of people there, and you're having a discussion about, let's say, the football. Or in Australia and in other parts of the world, you have to call it soccer, but I'm talking about the one you play with your feet. I don't know why they call it. Uh, I can't call it football, because you play with your feet, but anyway, different matter. But let's say this particular night, you're at dinner, everybody's talking about the World Cup in 2010. And let's say they're talking about England's performance and everybody's in agreement that it was a poor performance, it was very bad, it was very disappointing. That's no fun for a high dominant person because they want challenge. So often you'll find a high dominant person will actually go against the trend, buck the conversation, if you will, purely to get a debate or a challenge going, even if they agree in the first place, just to create something a little bit more dynamic than everybody agreeing in the favorable environment. Ever noticed that before? Ever done it yourself? If you're high D, it's highly, highly likely. High I behavior, from a needs perspective, number one need is to feel significant. If a high I person delivers a presentation to you, or some sort of conversation, or any kind of presentation really, and you don't give them feedback, that's as good as giving bad feedback. High I people behaviors rather want feedback, constructive feedback. If you want to make them feel a million dollars or pounds, simply say really nice things about them. It makes a world of difference. At the same time, you can cut a high eye person very easily if you say some really, really harsh words. Very people orientated. Remember, the harsh words would take them from their normal favorable environment and put them in the unfavorable environment, which could be conflict, it could be Again, if you say some horrible things, you may not be liking them, puts them in an unfavorable environment. So high eye behaviors could do with learning how to be more in an unfavorable environment, learning that everything's not personal. And also, because they're high influence, they feel they can change an environment through their, through their language and through their persuasion. High eye behaviors need to learn that some things around here or some things in life have laws governed by them. So whether that's from government, whether it's from traffic, whether it's speeding, for instance, there might be speed limits. High eyes struggle with laws and rules often because they feel they can change the environment. But there's some things that even a high eye behavior cannot change. So they've got to practice moving in to uh, being more, not controlled, but abiding by other people's laws, else you get into trouble in today's world. High S behavior, I've already mentioned their number one goal really and their number one need is for security and for teamwork and for keeping things as they are. So it's very much, again, slowly, slowly, steady, steady, hence the name steadiness. High S behavioral people, again, like to be liked, as most people do. These, these guys over here, more task orientated, so don't really care that much about being liked, whereas these two, these two behavioral styles very much do. But the problem often with high S behavior is they can do other people's work for them because they want to be liked. Now, what's the challenge with that? Well, the challenge is that you end up doing everyone else's work except your own. And by doing everyone else's work, you're actually doing other people an injustice about their own learning and their own growth. They may rely on you, they may drain your energy. You may, if you're high S, do a lot more for others than you do for yourself. 
But now, learning this technology, it's about time we start giving back to ourselves. Learn coming to an unfavorable environment, learning to say no. Very rare for a high S, very high S behavior to do that. Often if I'm coaching somebody that's high S, they often don't complain in a restaurant, for example, if the food's not up to scratch. They might if it was terrible, terrible, but if it wasn't that good or it wasn't warm or something was late, often they won't say a word. So as an exercise, I'll often get the high S behavioral style to go into even a cafe and after they've ordered something, complain about it, even if it's okay, purely to build up that mental muscle. Because even complaining about something even as simple as a coffee could be very unfavorable for a high S behavioral style. I mentioned they don't like conflict at all, tend to avoid it, and then those things can build up and build up and build up until they explode. I actually had one client, it was a corporate client, and one of the, the managers was very high S, and occasionally she would just disappear. You know, there was regular contact between her and I via email, and often phone calls, I'd get her to call me every week or two, but the phone calls became less and less, so did the emails, and she was actually hiding because she hadn't done what she said she would do, and there was a couple of other issues. So rather than address those issues with myself and her colleagues, she would tend to hide in the hope that those issues would go away, which obviously very rarely did they go away. So it's much better to practice coming over here, being more in an unfavorable environment to get that practice change, practice just facing your fears a little bit, just step by step, you know, one step every single day or every second day in a month's time and a year's time, there's a whole lot of growth there. And then we come back to high C. Number one need by far is accuracy. So I mentioned if you have a client or potential client that happens to be high C behavior, make sure you give them all the details. I've got, actually got a couple of friends, good friends of mine that are very high C behavior and they tend to do a lot of research and they'll research the product in depth, they'll research the competitor's product in depth. One friend took six months to buy one watch. Uh, it's, this might seem funny to other behavioral stars that aren't like that, but the one thing that I know, and I'm not high C behavior, I won't tell you what I am, but you can guess from the overview that I've given you, I know if there's a product that I like or I'm interested in, and I know if one of these two friends have actually researched this product, I will just trust their word because they would have researched it to the max. I actually don't like to do the research. I get other people, whether it's people that work for me or friends to do that because that's not my gig. I'm much more people you're orientated, which will give you a bit of a clue to my main behavioral style. And that's the overview there. So to find out specifically what your primary uh, behavioral style is, remember said, there's always a, or generally there's a primary and a secondary, you can actually go through a DISC profile. And if you are interested in that, you can just send me a quick email and I'll give you the information on that. But hopefully from this overview, you've got a really good understanding of what DISC is all around. Using the language high D, high I, high S, high C makes it really, really easy to implement. It makes it really easy often to identify where somebody's coming from. You know, like a high D person, often very direct, wants to get to the point. So you can see and hear that in their language. They're often more goals orientated because they're after achievement. High I person, very people oriented. So generally very friendly, very talkative usually. Uh, all sorts of things you can tell by a high I person. High steadiness, a lot slower, doesn't like change. And then the high C, looking for accuracy. Often big thinkers, you can see really methodical, a lot maybe slower pace as well, more task orientated. So learning this and applying this in your daily life will enhance your relationships with your family and really bring that bond even closer, even if you have a close bond already. With work, second to none, you, know, you can start building better relationships, which in turn allows you to be more effective in your everyday communication and build those relationships up and up. Get more favors, earn more money, be uh, rewarded with more fulfilling relationships, which I think you know, you'll agree is a, a big part of life. 
and is really what make, makes the world go round and makes it really, really enjoyable. So my final point is transform the way you communicate with the world. You now have an opportunity to do that. So it's been a pleasure bringing this video, making this video for you. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, if you'd like to do a profile or any question or feedback at all, I'd highly appreciate that. Simply send me an email. It's adrian at law2success.com. That's adrian at law, L-A-W-T-O, 2success.com. Okay, bye for now.